Right. Uh, so once again, good uh, morning, good afternoon to all of you. So the next session that we are going to cover today is on uh, tracker terminology and tracker data model. Now, um, it, it is so good to see so many familiar faces. So I know like um, uh, some of you have been working with DHS2 for a while, may have also been experimenting. So you are kind of familiar with tracker. But I also noted there are a few participants who are kind of new to tracker. But for all of you, I really recommend, uh, I mean, this tracker data model and understanding the terminology is the key, uh, even though when, I mean, uh, is the key if you are going to configure the tracker put, uh, in DHS2 or even uh, you are going to use uh, the DHS2 tracker for the analyzing data. So for whatever the purpose that you are going to use, uh, use DHS2 for, uh, it will be very important to understand the data model. So I hope uh, in next 30 minutes or so, you'll be patiently uh, listening to uh, what I'll be presenting. And in addition, I also expect you to be actively engaged. Uh, you can ask questions, of course, you can use uh, Slack or the Zoom chat whenever you have a question. And sometimes I, I may ask one or two questions where you can raise hand and unmute yourself and answer. Because I feel like this is the core <clears throat> which uh, you really need to be clear of before you uh, start analyzing or using the data which is captured in DHS2 uh, tracker. All right. <clears throat> so uh, let's see what we are going to cover today and the objectives. Uh, so the first objective is to understand what a data model is and how it relates to the DHS2 tracker. And then we will define the common terms used within the DHS2 tracker data model, which are very important. And then we will describe the general flow of information used within the DHS2 tracker data model, like how, where we are capturing data and how it flows throughout the tracker data model. That's what we are going to uh, cover in the third objective. And finally, we will also try to understand how these components of the DHS2 tracker data model are linked together. So these are not just isolated building blocks. These are all interconnected. And actually, this interconnection is what makes the DHS2 uh, tracker so flexible in uh, rendering different use cases. Right? Okay. So what is the tracker data model? And in fact, what is a data model? So in fact, uh, in the DHIS2, the data model is a fixed part which cannot be modified. So this you have to clearly understand. Whenever, uh, uh, if, a, if a client or stakeholder or you by yourself encounters a use case and you are in doubt to, select, to decide whether you can use DHIS2 for this use case or not, the best thing you have to uh, always remember is that you will have to compare and you have to actually analyze the use case and identify all the elements uh, and, and different workflows within the use case and see whether the DHS2 data model is supporting this particular use case. So if it is not supporting, then it might not be ideal to use DHS2 as a standalone solution for your use case. Right? So that's as simple as that. So this is exactly why you will have to understand what the DHS2 data model for tracker is. So then only you will be able to decide whether it is going to serve your requirements in customizing or adopting DHS2 to serve your requirement. Okay. So this includes the required structures and objects that define how we can set up metadata and store our data. So I hope you are familiar with these two concepts called metadata and data. So data are actually this granular, the actual data that you will be storing in the DHIS2 or whatever the database. What we mean by metadata is actually data, some information about the data that you are going to capture. So metadata is actually what formulates the structure. You can think of it something like uh, for you to uh, say, for example, in good old days, if you are actually collecting uh, some data and you are want, I mean, you are going to put them in a table, you would draw a table, right? And you will draw a table and you will kind of um, name the column headings and maybe the row headings, right? So basically these column headings and row headings are kind of defining what will be the data that you are collecting on that particular column or row. Right? So it kind of describes what will be there in that particular row or column. 
So it is kind of defining uh, this data a bit further. So it's data about the data that you're capturing. So in fact, that is what we mean by metadata. So in DHS2 also, we have something called metadata that you usually configure once before start collecting data. So when it comes to configuring your DHS2 tracker, what you will do first is to configure the metadata, right? So for example, uh, these are the different types of metadata that uh, we are using in DHS2, some of them. So organization units, you must be definitely familiar because you have, you have all done the fundamentals. So we, we talk a lot about org, org units and data elements, indicators. And when it comes to tracker, we are uh, talking about few other new uh, metadata items such as programs, tracked entity attributes and many more. So what we are going to discuss in today's presentation is about this metadata which formulates the tracker data model. Right? But we will not be talking uh, uh, too much about the, uh, the metadata that, that are general metadata you might also find when you are configuring DHIS2 for aggregate use cases. I guess you all must be familiar with uh, the, the, these general metadata because you have covered the DHIS2 fundamentals. Right. So this slide kind of highlights all major types of metadata involved with the tracker. Right. There are few other finer areas which will not uh, include in this slide because we don't want to really confuse you too much at the beginning, but we will be talking about them uh, while we are in the course of this academy. Right. So uh, now when it comes to the tracker data model, we can actually divide all the terminologies and metadata uh, components into two broader categories. Right. So what you are seeing uh, at the top right inside this orange color box for example the concepts such as tracked entity tracked entity attributes and tracked entity instance they kind of identifies the concept that we are going to track right so the dhis2 tracker is called and named as tracker mainly because we are going to track right uh, of course we have two separate components within the tracker called the event and the tracker events are kind of one of uh, incidents, whereas tracker is where we are kind of longitudinally throughout time dimension, we are going to track a particular entity. So this entity can be anything. It could be a, a live entity like a person or maybe an animal if you are kind of implementing DHIS2 in veterinary uh, sector or else it could be a, 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 any um, object. So it could be a laboratory equipment, right, or else a sample. If you are kind of uh, collecting, I mean, it all depends on the use case that you are going to use DHIS2 for. So these three concepts are kind of identifies what we are tracking. Okay. So all the other concepts that we are highlighting in this blue color box below, for example, program, program stage, event, data element, option set, option. This kind of describes the information we are collecting about the concept that we are tracking. So for example, if we are tracking a person, so everything related to the person are included and defined by these three metadata concepts that we are, uh, that we are highlighting in this orange box. And what actually the items or data points that we are collecting are, 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 are inside all this i mean it is captured in an environment which can which is constituted by all these metadata items which are highlighted in the blue box okay i i assume you understand up to this point but what we are going to do next is to kind of explain and go through all these type of different types of metadata items okay right do we have any questions as of now i don't see any on the chat i hope there is nothing on the Slack as well. Right. <clears throat> okay. So let us now see what we mean by these first three metadata items, which describes the entity. So I will start with the second one, the tracked entity. So as, as, the, as, the, as it implies, it's, it refers to the type of concept that is being tracked, right? So the tracked entity means the type of concepts that we are going to track in DHIS2. So this could be a person. In most of our implementations in health sector, I must mention health sector because 
right um, i mean right now we are seeing a kind of a trend where dhis2 is increasingly being used in outside of the health sector as well okay so in the health sector it's mainly the persons are, are what we are tracking so basically at a very broad level a person could be a tracked entity but in case if your dhis2 implementation or is focusing mainly on the laboratory sample the laboratory sample could be the one that we are tracking right so but i must also mention in one single dhis2 implementation you can have one or more than one tracked entity types configured right so for example in a in an ideal covid implementation you might have uh, you might be tracking persons you might be tracking laboratory samples and you might even be tracking cases right so that way you will have to define all these as uh, tracked entities in your tracker configuration okay right let's now um, uh, go to the third one which is actually the tracked entity instance so as the word uh, the, these three words implies this actually means a single uh, instance of this tracked entity. So, for example, if you configure a broader concept called person as a tracked entity, the person names, uh, named James or Andrew could be the tracked entity instance, right? So, if you are coming from an IT or informatics background, this is something related, uh, similar to this object class and object relationship right so you have class is a kind of a broader thing an object is one single entity right so sim uh, similarly here tracked entity is this broad concept for example a person and person names name james could be the tracked entity instance right uh, so laboratory sample would be the tracked entity and uh, laboratory sample uh, a105 could be the tracked entity instance okay so this is basically a kind of a group and one single instance concept that we are describing by using this term tracked entity instance okay right so all these tracked entities are inherently uh, having their own properties okay so for example if we register a person as a tracked entity the person has the per, uh, its own properties these are usually semi-permanent right and uh, these are the ones that we refer with this concept called tracked entity attributes so if we have a tracked entity called person the person's attributes or properties are the ones that we define as tracked entity attributes so for example if our tracked entity is a person uh, national identity the name sex date of birth, address, phone numbers are individual attributes of these persons, right? So you have to define when you are configuring your DHS2 tracker, all these attributes separately for that tracked entity, okay? Unfortunately, we are not going to cover the configuration part of these tracked entities and tracked entity attributes in this particular uh, academy because we have a separate academy called tracker configuration level one. Uh, to serve this purpose but here I'm just we are just trying to highlight how the configuration of your tracker instance is linked to the data use that you are going to actually study during this academy okay right so I hope uh, uh, are there any questions right any questions related to this uh, this presentation others of course my colleagues will be attending to uh, the logistics issues related to slack and all they will be attended but are there any questions you have uh, about the three concepts that i have described so far if there are any questions please type in the chat box or else you can even raise your hand great so i don't see uh, any any specific questions very good right so let's move forward now the blue box right so now we are going we we, we, are, we are already familiar with these concepts called tracked entity tracked entity instance and tracked entity uh, at attributes did someone unmute yes sashan i'm seeing you are unmuted uh, do you have any questions all right so probably it's a mistake no, no sorry it's not okay all good 
Right. Uh, so now what we are going to discuss is about the data, right, that we are going to collect or uh, about these entities that we are going to track. So there are a few concepts related to this uh, configuration of this trade data, right? So the first one is a program. So what do we mean by a program? A program defines the sequence of events that and that a tracked entity can go through. Okay. So I'm, I'm repeating it again. It's a kind of a sequence of events a tracked entity can go through. Okay. So for example, if we define something or some concept called a disease surveillance as the program, right? Disease surveillance as the program, what it means is if we have this tracked entity called person, and if we have the tracked entity called uh, tracked entity instance called James, this person James, what he will, the, the sequence of events he will go through during the data collection, right, is what we refer to as a, a program. So, for example, if we have a program called disease surveillance and James is a part of that program, it is like all the sequence of events that we are going to capture uh, for James that's it, that's it. Um, is what we are going to define in, in, in this concept called uh, program, right? So uh, now here, this program, of course, will have like so much of data that we are going to capture that it will be too confusing to list all of them at one go, right? So what we actually do in this broader program called, for example, disease surveillance, we kind of break down all the particular uh, different events uh, that he's, he's, he has to undergo into broader categories, right? So these broader categories are what we call as program stages, right? So program is a very broader thing that uh, a tracked entity will go through and that we are kind of compartmentalizing and uh, into stages. So that those of course uh, are what we define as program stages. So for example, um, in a disease surveillance program, it could involve broader categories of events such as clinical examination, right? And then specimens, if we take some samples uh, from that pe pe person, we are, we, we are the, the tracking of this specimen, laboratory results and case investigation. So these are broader events, broader areas that we are going to collect data on, right? So these, of course, we can kind of define as program stages, right? So ideally speaking, program stage kind of defines what data should be collected during a specific type of event within the broader program. So for example, uh, lab result stage, if we have something like that, it will collect information about the lab results events, right? So these can be one uh, single event or repeatable event. So for example, uh, uh, in most of the instances, clinical examination, we are kind of doing once, right? So uh, we, we may not want to have that particular type of event repeated, right? It, I mean, this is an example. You may have pressing reasons to have it repeatable. If that is the case, you are you can you are feel free to define it as a repeatable kind of a uh, stage or else you just uh, uh, can define it as a non repeatable. one. OK, so uh, what we try to highlight in this slide is that we have something called program where we can kind of connect a tracked entity into right inside the program. We are collecting the actual data. Right. And this program, because it's a kind of a broader thing, we can compartmentalize it into different stages. So these stages, of course, which, which I will mention next, will, will be the uh, kind of a, a, a snapshot where we are collecting the actual data, which I will be explaining in the next slide, right? So are you all kind of okay with this uh, program and program stages, or do you have any questions? Yeah, uh, right. So I have a question here from Dr. Janaka about explain more on tracked entity instance. So um, uh, um, uh, if you can, of course, unmute and ask uh, the specific question or in fact, like what we are going to do uh, once we have defined all these concepts is to kind of uh, have one slide where we will kind of go through a particular use case. So you will understand it a bit more. 
So uh, uh, shall we do it there or you want to ask the question now itself? Okay, all right, okay. So let's proceed and <clears throat> we'll take up uh, in that uh, final slide, right. Okay, so now we have discussed about tracked entity, tracked entity instance and tracked entity attributes, program and program stages. Now let us see the next few concepts, which are the first one is event. So basically what we mean by event, it is actually a snapshot of a particular program stage, right? So program stage can ideally have one or more events. So when a program stage is not repeatable, you have one to one match between a program stage and event, right? But when a program stage is repeatable, right? That particular program stage can have multiple events. Okay. So what we actually mean by event is an instance of a program stage. Again, kind of like an object task relationship. So we have something called program stage and a particular instance of this program stage is what we mean by uh, the term an event. It's actually an encounter, right? So these events for a program stage can be repeatable or non-repeatable. Some program stages, the way we define it, are non-repeatable because we are sure that these kind of uh, events only happen once for a particular track entity when he's enrolled in that program, right? But sometimes you can have multiple events. So for example, if we have, uh, say, collecting collection of uh, specimens, uh, it might be that we are collecting multiple specimen. We, we might take, say, nasal swabs, so we might take uh, even blood sample, urine sample. So that kind of a program stage, we can't actually define it as non-repeatable because we might have repeatable events. Okay, But uh, for example, based on your context, something like uh, clinical examination, you can do it once for, for the surveillance example. But if you are configuring a program uh, for say a clinic or uh, say, um, I mean, uh, maybe uh, in board setup, right? They are a clinical examination is something that you might do on daily basis even, right? So if that is the case, then you can actually configure it as uh, repeatable. So what I try to highlight here is there are no hard and fast rules as how you should configure it. It is all very contextual based on your use case. You have the freedom to define the DHS to the way you want, but to do that, you have to understand the limitations and the data model very well. Otherwise, after configuring, when you start collecting data, you will encounter issues. Okay, right. So I hope you understand the concept event, which is actually one instance of a program stage. Okay, do you have any questions? No. All right. So next we will be discussing about a uh, uh, few other concepts which actually kind of connects the tracked entity that we described first with this program and the data that we are collecting. Okay. So let's start from the uh, one below which is called the enrollment. So what we mean by enrollment, it is the process of taking a tracked entity and registering them into a program. Okay, so remember, uh, in the first slide I mentioned that I, uh, we showed there are, there were these two boxes, right? One with uh, one with a uh, orange uh, lining and the other one uh, with a uh, uh, blue lining, right? So these are two different types of concepts that we are that is associated with the tracker data model. And we mentioned there is something called tracked entity. And then we also mentioned few other concepts related to program, program stages and events. These are actually the sequence of events this tracked entity will go through. But for this to happen, we need to actually connect, right? The tracked entity with this program. This connection or registration process of a tracked entity into a program, right? This is what we uh, refer to as enrollment. Okay, and together with enrollment, we generally tend to define these two other concepts. First one is the enrollment date. So what we mean by enrollment date is a date the entity is enrolled into the program. So for example, uh, in the COVID-19 uh, use case, the date 
the COVID-19 patient visits the clinic and receives their initial diagnosis and assessment would be the rational date to be considered as an enrollment date. Okay, because like when the patient comes to the hospital and we are suspecting this patient uh, to be having COVID, then only we kind of, uh, you know, tag or label that patient as suspected COVID and start, uh, you know, enrolling and start investigating to confirm whether this per person is actually having COVID. So that's the kind of, uh, that's actually the date where everything is triggered and all these actions starts, right? So that we generally tend to consider as the enrollment date for this given use case. But having said that, is it fair to consider that uh, the, the day the patient came to the hospital and we detect that person and we suspect and start investigating as the date the patient actually got COVID? It is not, right? So we all know like uh, in most of these infectious diseases, there is, a, there is a window period from the day the patient actually contracts the uh, disease uh, to the day he actually starts showing symptoms so that he will be presented to our health system, right? So that is why we all also have another concept in the DHS2 tracker called the incident date. So here it is a date which actually triggers the first event. So for example, it could be even like, so this again is very contextual, right? So here we, we have to define a date where uh, you know, like the patient can recall or like we kind of in our health system, we agree like what is the, I mean, when do we consider as the date he got COVID? So for, for example, the date of onset of COVID symptoms could be considered as the uh, date of incidence, right? So again, no hard and fast rules. So we don't need to argue about uh, uh, a given scenario and the public health perspective on that, right? This is all about configuring and using DHS too. So here you have the freedom based on your expertise to decide what should be matching date for the incident date and what would be the one that you'll be using for the enrollment date. And I must also mention in some of the tracker use cases, it is optional to define an incident date, right? So because for infectious diseases, so for surveillance and communicable diseases, it may be very relevant. But there may be other examples that we are using for tracker, where, where we are actually using tracker, where uh, using the concept called incident date is not that relevant, right? So it's a kind of optional feature that we have in DHIS2. Is everyone clear? Are there any questions about the technicality of these dates, not the public health aspect of it? Okay, all right. I don't see any questions in the chat and no hands raised. So I believe that you understand everything I have, uh, we have been discussing. It can be even the other way around, I hope not, but let's see. All right, so the next is where we discuss about the actual data that we are going to collect. So to do that, again, going back to uh, the experience you have with DHS2 aggregate, you know, in DHS2, how we collect data, I mean, basically the variables uh, where you are collecting data in the DHS2 terminology, we define it as a data element, right? So even in tracker, the, the granular uh, metadata that we are actually collecting the data is called the data elements. But the, uh, uh, but the, the uh, thing special here is these data elements in the DHS2 tracker, we have to define them as tracker. You remember when you are configuring uh, data elements in DHIS2, it, it prompts us to select whether it's an aggregate type data element or a tracker type data element. Remember, these have to be defined as tracker type data elements when you are defining the data elements for them to be available to be capturing tracker data. Okay, so uh, here the data element actually uh, we can define it as a data points collected within a program stage. For example, if we have uh, a, a program stage uh, called laboratory tests. Uh, the laboratory test result could be the data element, right? Because that's the one actually which is collecting positive, negative, like all these uh, different possibilities are collected uh, actually at, at this data element level. So what we are actually doing here is we have to define a data element 
And when we are configuring the tracker program, we are assigning this data element to the particular program stage. Okay. So important to remember, it has to be the type tracker. So when it comes to data elements, you must be familiar that you can kind of define what type, uh, what is the data type that you are collecting, right? It could be a number type where you can actually even have decimal, right? It could be integer. So in that case, it could be positive integer, negative, positive, zero, positive integer, right? It could be yes, no type, and it can even be text. So usually when uh, the data element is generally type of text or categorical data uh, and the data element is of categorical type, right? Because of the requirement of analysis, we tend to configure options and option sets. So again, I think you must be familiar with this from the DHS to foundation, I mean, uh, uh, the courses, the fundamentals. So what we mean by option set in DHIS2 is a predefined related list of values for data elements, right? So uh, uh, actually options is the, uh, the, the related, the broader term, the, the name that we are giving for this group or the set and option are individual values within option set. So for example, if you can have a, a option set called gender, male and female would be the individual options in that option set. Just to recap, okay? So, supposing if your data element uh, uh, that you are collecting is a categorical type of a data, like say, for example, you want to collect data about the gender. So, so, for example, let's take this one, laboratory test result, right? So, the test result could either be what? It could be positive, negative, or it could be inconclusive. So, these are the three possibilities. So, in, for that case, we might define the data element as the type text, right? And then what we will actually do is we need to have this positive, negative, inconclusive defined, right? So how, where we are defining it is by creating an option set. So we can actually create option set called test result and have the individual options, positive, negative, inconclusive attached to that option set test result. And once we have this option set called test result, we can uh, connect that to the data element. All this we can do when we are configuring the data element. So this part, of course, we are not going into too much detail here. I'm just uh, mentioning them to recap. But if you uh, don't remember, please refer the material uh, related to the DHS to Fundamentals Academy. All right. Any questions up to this point? No questions so far. All right. Right. So let us now see how we are connecting all these different, um, I mean, objects that we have discussed. Okay. So it's a bit of a crowded slide. Don't get too confused. Let's take one by one. So uh, right at the top, right at the top, let's focus on this uh, box that you have uh, at the left uh, top corner. We have something called tracked entity, tracked entity attributes, and uh, the, the, the tracked entities, right? So here we are discussing about the person that we are registering in our use case, okay? So we have the person registered in the system, number one. And then we will have different programs. I told you, right? In DHIS2 instance, you can have one program or you can have multiple programs. So the broad objective is something like this. Let me tell you a story. Okay. So in an ideal setting, say like if you are configuring DHIS2 for your country, ideally a tracked entity, if you have a tracked entity called person, the person has to be registered in the DHIS2 tracker when he is born. Okay. So after that, that person during his lifetime, will be encountering and will be facing, uh, will be having encounters with your health system for various purposes. So the moment the person or the child is born, we might be giving the birth vaccine, right? So that means if we have a program configured to collect immunization data, ideally, if you have a person or the baby registered in the system, he has to have some, some connectivity and he has to be enrolled and followed up in the immunization program. So 
supposedly you have a separate program for child immunization once the child is enrolled at birth the child will be a part of that immunization program for like uh, till up to like say i don't know like it depends on your country it could be like even 15 years okay till the child is 15 years uh, the child will be uh, enrolled in the childhood immunization program and in the meantime let's assume uh, now this child uh, like say maybe when the child is two or three years old um, we might diagnose that uh, we might detect this child is having major nutrition problem right so in that case you may have a separate program in your dhis2 instance to collect data related to nutrition okay so there what we are going to do is till up uh, up until uh, age two the child was only part of uh, the immunization program the childhood immunization program and at two years we will decide okay this child is having a nutrition problem so we are going to um, uh, enroll this child into the nutrition program so that we can very closely monitor maybe we can actually like if your general practice is not to measure height and weight monthly but now that this child is having nutrition problem we might decide okay we are going to measure the height and weight slash length on a monthly basis right oh and then we might do some intervention so for that purpose we will enroll this child who's already enrolled in the immunization program also to the trial nutrition program by say supposing at age three we detect that child is child's nutrition problem is now solved we, he doesn't really need to be followed up in the nutrition program anymore so what we will do is we will can complete the active enrollment that we created for that child for the nutrition program but that doesn't mean the child uh, is not required to be in a, i mean the child is required to complete his enrollment for the immunization program because that will continue till age 15. so that means at age three he only again having enrollment to the immunization program okay and okay let's let's go uh, even further at age 18 this child again i mean no longer child i mean now a grown-up uh, supposing the child is a female, uh, she gets married and she gets pregnant. Okay, at age 18, the child may no longer be actually a part of immun childhood immunization program because she has kind of completed all the milestones and everything uh, that we are uh, collecting information for the immunization. But because now she is pregnant, she is encountered by our health system, and we might need to we actually need to uh, enroll this lady into the antenatal care program. Right, and then we will be having separate program stages and the different events and the, the data that we are collecting related to the antenatal care program. Right, so this is how, how it continues. So the tracker is kind of a life cycle approach. So a tracked entity could be enrolled in multiple different programs at a, at a given time. That's the first scenario. Or else the tracked entity can be enrolled only in a single program at a given time. Okay, it could be the second scenario. Or thirdly, the tracked entity could not be having any active enrollments for any of the programs at a given time. Do you all understand? Right? Think of my life cycle approach I mentioned. Those three uh, possible scenarios can happen. Right? So this is again same for a, for a different tracked entity, but for the uh, uh, simplicity. I mean, I didn't want to kind of uh, confuse and by taking complex examples, I took this scenario. Okay. Is there any questions? I hope not. No. All right. So let's go back to the slide. So we have the tracked entity, right? And what we are actually doing is whenever we have a requirement, we enroll this tracked entity or else the tracked entity instance, if it is the name of the, I mean, if you are thinking of an actual person, we do something called enrollment of the tracked entity instance into one of the programs. It could be one or more given your requirement, right? And inside the program, we are collecting different data, right? A series of data. And this, this, this series of data are actually categorized based on program stages. So program stages are generally the actual enrollments, right? So if we, uh, so when a, when a, when a patient uh, or person is in, uh, encountered with the health system, he comes there for a reason and the data that we are collecting, we can always categorize and put them under program stages and inside the program stages, we might, you know, like collect data based on data elements. It could be anything, right? It could be the numbers, 
it could be the gender it could be the test result anything right so uh, this is what we try to highlight in this particular slide is everything clear any questions all right i'm impressed right now this is a very interesting slide highlighting everything okay let's start somewhere from the where where should we start okay let's start with uh, tract entity so here on to your left we have this generic concepts and tracker terminology on to your right what you're seeing are the probable use cases right uh, actually we have taken one use case and different um, uh, granular configurations that we are going to do in uh, related to that use case are highlighted onto the onto your right all right let's start so let's first start with the track entity the, the green one so here if our example is around uh, you know uh, tracking uh, patients related to covid-19 or our requirement is around covid-19 surveillance the first thing we should do is to register a person right so the person is what we are going to register as the tract entity and once we do that this person is having different attributes so some of the attributes we have mentioned here so the person can have tract entity attributes such as first name last name sex and many more right you can think of whatever the attributes that you want to define and uh, uh, configure it in the uh, dhis2 as tract entity attributes right okay and let's go further down we will skip enrollment for now and then we need to so once we have defined tract entity and tract entity attributes we have to actually define the program so what's the program here it's covid 19 surveillance okay so inside covid 19 surveillance now we have to actually like see we we need to have a design document first before actually configuring all this because we can't actually because in, in fact in dhis2 the order in which we are configuring is slightly different we are not really you know like starting uh, by configuring the program because we start uh, from the bottom but this of course is out of scope for this academy we are not going into too much of detail but you need to have a design document uh, identifying all these different uh, metadata items that you are going to configure in your instance so here the program the broader program is covid-19 surveillance right and then inside that program we have to identify the program stages the broader categories so for example here we have the clinical examination is one broader set of data that we are going to collect and we want to define it as a separate program stage and we might also define the laboratory request to be again a different program stage and when they want to issue the result, everything related to the result could be another program stage and the outcome of that patient as a separate stage, because, you know, like outcome is something that that comes separately. So again, when you are defining program stages, you can think of it as a as an encounter. I mean, like what kind of encounters this patient and the patients like uh, I mean, different experiences related to the uh, uh, to this program can have. That's how you are kind of defining the program stages. So again, I mentioned event is a snapshot of a program stage, or basically it's a program stage instance. So here, uh, clinical examination for this particular use case, we assume we define that this is not a repeatable one. So that's why we only have one single uh, event for the clinical examination where the uh, me, uh, medical personnel will um, uh, see the patient and examine and find out if, uh, I mean all, all um, like uh, details related to the examination and then we have laboratory requests of course we can send multiple lab, lab requests for different samples so this way it's going to be a repeatable one that's why we have many events for the lab request same with laboratory results because again, like when we send multiple requests, you are definitely going to get multiple results. And the outcome for this uh, particular use case, it's we have defined it as non-repeatable. So we will only have one outcome event, okay? So for all these events, where we are actually, you know, collecting and storing data are on data elements. So that's why we have to define data elements first and assign them to the program stages. Okay, 
So here, for the clinical examination, one, um, uh, I mean, like for the clinical examination, we can find, like, I mean, we can identify different data elements, right? It could be the temperature, right? Uh, it could be the blood pressure, heart rate, all these could be different data elements that we are collecting for the stage clinical examination. Uh, but here for this example, for the in this slide, what we have done is we have kind of analyzed a bit of uh, what uh, data elements we'll be collecting for the laboratory request program stage. So here we have identified some of them. One could be lab test, the reason for laboratory test, right? And the type of test and the type of specimen. So these are the individual data elements because these are actually the variables we are going to collect the data on. Right. So we have defined them as data elements uh, for this particular use case. Now, the lab test reason in this instance, reason could be what kind of data? It, it probably will be a text data, right? So here uh, we have decided it to have a kind of a free, te free text, but the type of test we have decided we should not kind of give the freedom for the people to enter free text, but rather we will get them um, um, only to select right one of the few options. So for that, we have uh, defined the option set called type of test, and we are collecting these individual options, PCR, NNAT, and serology, right? So likewise, we have different uh, options that we have defined here, okay? And then these options have been assigned to type of test, and this type of test we have linked it to the data element type of test, right? And then finally, what we are doing is, we have to connect this tract entity into the program, and that's what we mean by the enrollment, right? So the enrollment is what actually links a tract entity instance who is already there in the system to the program, right? Remember what I said, I mentioned a tract entity which is already there in the system to the program. But actually in the real world, what we, what we usually tend to do, the first time a person is encountered with the system, we do two things generally. What we do is we actually register that tract entity instance into the DHIS2 environment, and we also enroll that person into a program. These two we are doing generally the first time we are encountered with the patient, right? But subsequently, if the patient is already there in the, or the person is already there in the system, what we do is if we have a new requirement to enroll this person to a different program, we search and create a new enrollment for an existing person to the new program, okay? So that's what we are actually doing. So that's kind of the summary of uh, the program. I mean, the, the, the data model related to the tracker. Any questions you have? Yeah, uh, Dr. Pamo, I have one question regarding yes, option Dr. set. Yeah, yeah option yeah. set. Uh, if suppose there is a one option set called negative and options are negative and positive, that uh, option set can be linked to more than one data element? Option set can be linked to more than one data element. Yes, correct. Thank you. That's possible, yes. Any other questions? Yes, Arsalan. Uh, tract entity like person can create, okay. Yes, now now one, one concept that we didn't include here is the relationships, right? Because it's a bit, bit complex. Uh, so there is one other concept in the DHS2 tracker called relationships. So basically what relationship does is to link a tract entity to a different tract entity, or else we can link a tract entity to an event or program stage, right? So likewise, we can create links between some of these concepts that we have discussed here. For example, tract entities and events can be linked to each other, right? This becomes useful, especially when you want to create a map kind of a visualization, for example, for contact uh, mapping visualization, right? This is where map as in not a geographic map, right? I mean, map of different entities, uh, usually what we see when we are doing contact tracing. Yeah. 
so for this relationships is one that we that we are using and we'll be discussing and showing you that uh, in in during the uh, academy in the course of the academy but we don't we didn't actually include it here uh, we, because we didn't want to actually make uh, it, it a bit too complex right yes there is another concept called relationship that's why i said like some of the uh, kind of complex um, um, concepts we are not discussing in this particular presentation but uh, thank you for asking I hope it is clear. Yes, uh, uh, when it comes to analysis, we have some limitations uh, analyzing and visualizing the relationships, which uh, are of course, uh, I mean, which which will be enhanced more in the upcoming versions of DHS two. Any more questions? Is this all clear? So I, I mean, again, I would really appreciate. I don't know whether we are how how strict we are with the time, Saurabh. Uh, <laughs> So what we can actually do is if uh, any one of you have a use case, right, a very simple use case, don't take a very complex one. We can actually like, uh, you can all contribute and we can have a discussion, a small one, like uh, maybe five, 10 minutes max. You want to do that or we can actually do a proper quiz, which is already there in the uh, Moodle. Any other questions? Or anybody wants to discuss a, a very simple scenario or a tracker use case that you have? All right, Surati, uh, there's a question. Can we actually have more than one value for a data element? I have a use case for diagnosis EMR where we can. Okay, <laughs> good question. So this is actually not related to the tracker itself. It's actually about the DHIS2 platform. So at the moment, DHIS2 data elements uh, are, are only collecting and registering a single value based on the data type. So. What I mean specifically by this is, say for example, if your data element is defined as the data type yes, no, you can store either yes or no, right? But if your data type is configured as integer, say zero positive integer, it can only collect and store a single value from zero to whatever the number, right? And if your data element is defined as text, then you can actually store a text or string value. And if this text type data element is also having an attached option set, which may be having multiple options, you are only allowed to store a single option value from that large option, I, 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 option set. I assume your requirement is around uh, uh, recording multiple options from that single option set, right? I presume so. Uh, unfortunately, it is not supported, but so the workaround is you will have to create separate data elements as of this time. But again, um, this has this this request and the feature has been highlighted and identified. So probably uh, in the roadmap, it will be included uh, and it might be a part of DHIS2 in the future, but as unfortunately not as of now. Do we have any other questions? So, great. I hope you understood, yes, Arsalan. Is it a good practice to use a single data element in stages? Is it a good practice to use a single data element in stages? So I assume your requirement is you have you have some pressing requirement uh, that you want to identify a particular encounter as a program stage. But in that program stage, you can only figure out collecting one single variable or one single data, element, right? So again, it's again very relative, contextual. So we'll have to see why you are kind of, uh, why you want um, so badly to have a separate program stage for that. But if, if you have very good reasons to do that, it's not a problem in, uh, in doing that. I mean, if you have a good reason, but generally we tend to have, uh, of course, uh, more than one data element generally collected in most of the program stages, but of course, it could be justified to only even have one uh, data element. There is no restriction when it comes to configuration. Welcome. 
Right, we have like uh, close to 40 participants, but I only heard from few of few. So what about the others? Did you all understand? Please feel free to ask questions. If you don't understand the concepts and data model, uh, I can assure that you are not going to have a very good uh, learning experience next week. And also like, uh, don't, don't get scared. If you don't understand all this at once, you can always uh, go, go back go through the presentation and there is one quiz in the Moodle. It's not graded, but uh, for you to, you know, like uh, check your knowledge and probably learn a bit more, please do that quiz in the Moodle for the day, uh, uh, which is which is there under the uh, data model. Um, so you will be definitely able to understand and clarify some of your doubts, but uh, don't get scared in case if you don't understand any, uh, any of these concepts that we have discussed. You can always ask these questions in the Slack and we will do our best to um, uh, answer them. But uh, we still have a few more minutes in case if you want to kind of clarify. Any questions? Okay, I, I, I really hope you all understood uh, all the concepts discussed. So, The final slide is, of course, about different examples of uh, tracker. Uh, we can have like pregnant woman tracking um, through antenatal care, delivery and postnatal care, and then child through full set of immunization services, patients receiving ART treatment, and TB patients diagnosed and receiving TB, uh, TB treatment, disease surveillance, malaria case investigation, and if you are thinking of education, student tracking, teacher tracking, right? And if you are thinking of uh, laboratory man or logistics management, you can track any commodity, right? If you are thinking of agriculture, you can track crops, right? If you are talking about uh, disaster management, I see some uh, interesting stakeholders here. You can think of like so many other things, right? So there are no limits on using DHS2 tracker for your use case. Only thing, please analyze the use case and see whether there are any exceptions where you cannot match your use case to the DHS2 tracker data model, right? That's that's my advice. Uh, and then uh, we, uh, thanks to all the efforts around uh, COVID-19, there's very good performance enhancements in DHS2 platform, the tracker. Uh, because you didn't ask questions, I will probably ask a few questions that you should have asked about the performance compared to how it was two years back. Right now, uh, we are we are actually having very good performance in collecting uh, tracker data. For example, I can mention in uh, in, in the region itself, uh, Sri Lanka right now has COVID immunization tracker, which has um, more than 60 million events recorded and more than 20 million track entity instances persons, right? Almost close to the entire population registered in one single DHS2 instance. And we also have some large scale instances, uh, DHS2 implementations in few other countries, including Bangladesh in the region. So yes, there are uh, many uh, examples where we are having very large tracker implementations. So the best thing is performance is something that has uh, really uh, enhanced over the last few months. And then uh, the analytics is again an area which has really um, improved and there will be a lot of new other features coming up uh, in the upcoming versions. Right. So I guess uh, this is all what we have. Yes, Cecilia, you have your hand raised. Please go ahead and ask a question. You can unmute. Okay, hi. Thank you so much for the session. Um, I just wanted to find out, so for each um, tracker I use, when setting up a tracker um, program, I I had an experience whereby I was given a tracker program to set up and I was supposed to replicate from some other instance of DHIS2. Um, there were no program stages set up. So the program was supposed to collect um, information on patients vaccinated for COVID-19. So everything was set up on using the tracker attributes, the name of the patient, the address, identification, age, and all that. And then 
um, if the person was um, vaccinated, yes, if you had first dose or second dose. So there were no program stages there. It got me a little bit confused. So I wanted to find out, does it work that way without setting up program stages? Or I don't know, are there <clears throat> particular programs that um, might not really need the program stages? So you just have generic information on the attributes and it's fine. Right, very good question. So if you go back to uh, what we discussed so far, so what we mean by tracker and track entity attributes. So track, uh, track entity is what we are going to track and track entity attributes are generally the properties. They tend to be semi-permanent related to that uh, particular patient or person. Right, if it is a person who we register. So ideally, if we collect doses and uh, things like that as attributes, that's not a very good setup because these are not semi-permanent data. Probably it was configured by someone um, um, who was not too uh, much aware about the tracker data model. So that's that that that's that's the kind of I mean DHIS two is a kind of a very sharp edged uh, blade, right? You can probably use it for a very good reasons. A, a, a very well configured tracker program will help you, you know, like uh, provide you a lot of insights related to decision making and all. And a bad configuration can again cause equally uh, damage. So ideally, in this example. You should have gone with programs and program stages because we, we I mean, we need only the I mean attributes to be defined as uh, data items which are semi permanent and which are properties uh, parts of that particular track entity you are tracking everything else should have been program stages and un un under the program stages, they have been configured as data elements. So I would say like that was not the ideal setup, uh, but DHIS2 is not preventing you that's that's the kind of beauty of dhs2 because it's so generic there might be instances where this is required so for example if you just want to pre-register your entire population right without actually having a program then what we will what you will actually do is just to register all the tract entities along with their tract entity attributes right the, as a as a startup that's that's where you will start so for that kind of uh, setup, DHS2 be uh, DHS2 has to be. Um, I mean, it, it, we should be able to do it with DHS2. So that's why it is allowed. But ideally, in most of our Im implementations, what we see is we generally get a use case. So we configure the tract entity and tract entity attributes as, and together we do the program as well. So ideally, uh, for the for the for the use case that you mentioned, we should have gone with setting up program program stages and the relevant uh, data elements. Thank you very much. I've gained um, a better understanding of that now. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah. Any more questions? What? I think there are no more questions. So um, let me hand over to Saurabh then. So Saurabh, um, uh, do we have anything else to uh, uh, one more thing, uh, I think uh, we have a feedback session, so please uh, provide the daily feedback, but I will uh, for the for this session, uh, what we did now. So, uh, Saurabh, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Pamod. Uh, so, uh, uh, we've reached the end of the uh, webinar for today. So uh, we will be starting with the academy course from uh, Monday onwards. So in the uh, announcements channel, we have uh, given the link to uh, create your account on the Moodle platform. So please uh, do so, so that you can access the course material and uh, and all the presentations and then the assignments which you need to do. Uh, so, uh, and then you have uh, your uh, agenda also available there. Uh, so please, um, we'll try to put up um, 
a calendar invite uh, since there are people who belong to different time zones at present but we'll also try to send a reminder email 15 minutes before the course so that you get a notification that the course is about to start and we'll also leave a message on slack as well about as uh, 15 minutes before we start the sessions on monday uh, in the meanwhile if there's anything else any questions please feel free to put on the uh, slack channel we'll review it and come back to you with answers uh, and if there's any announcement uh, and the recording for today's webinar as soon as it is available on the youtube channel we'll share the link on announcements channel on the slack workspace so please feel free to access it in future. Uh, and those who um, uh, who were uh, kind of dropping in between because of some reason, they can access the recordings for the full uh, webinar. So that is all for uh, today. Uh, any suggestions, please feel free to reach out to us to uh, through slack and uh, have a good weekend and we look forward towards uh, starting the academy course from uh, monday onwards so thank you everyone for your time and we meet again on monday